What in layouting under the surface? What's this about? Well, basically, you can say that it's about this. What do we have here? We have a, well, it says table form, so it's kind of given what we have here. It's a layout. If you think about it in body terms, it could be a vertical layout with spacing and margins. <clears throat> you can also think about it as a HTML layout, then it's not table in form, it's just a couple of divs or something. They are pretty neatly arranged like this. So, uh, nothing special, uh, except if you code this the wrong way, you will get some strange behavior when you start resizing your layout like this. This was pretty okay in Visual Basic 6, but uh, when you do some modern web application, it's not typically what you want. So this is what I will be talking about. How does the size of an element affect the size of another element? This is basically layouting. Uh, so how do we want this to behave? Well, obviously we want this to behave like this. So if we change the size, we change the size of the content. Pretty simple, right? So uh, how do you do this? If you want to create a web page that contains this kind of uh, layout, how would you do it? <coughs> Surely it's easy when you have HTML, because this is what HTML is about, creating layouts. Uh, so let's have a small look at how you would do this with HTML. If I give you the DOM structure, it looks something like this, or it looks exactly like this. So we have a div element containing two other div elements. You're free to write whatever CSS you like and make it look like this one over here. So what would you do? Well, pretty simple to get started. Uh, we set some size for the <coughs> outermost div. Uh, we add some padding to the outermost div so we get the nice border. And then we have the two child divs inside. They should be 100% wide naturally, so they nicely fill the space, 50% high. And, well, the border is just for show so you can see where where the divs are here. And we get the color from background colors from the orange and blue styles. So this is pretty simple. Uh, there's only one little problem here that we wanted something, a spacing between these two. So how do you get the spacing there? Well, with HTML it's simple. You add margin top to the second child. And then you get spacing. And as a bonus, of course, you get a completely messed up layout because 50% of the parent is still 50% of the parent. And now you have 2 times 50% plus an extra margin. And that's a bit more than 100%. So this is not what we wanted. We wanted something pretty close to this one, but not really. So what do we do then? Mm, we can take the body 6 approach to this. Uh, we specify the height in pixels. You can calculate easily that the height of the child node should be 140 and a half pixels in this case. That's 50% uh, of the whole layout, taking out the spacing between the children and also removing the border pixels. So then we get exactly the layout we wanted. Simple? Yes, very simple. Uh, except if you resize this, it will look exactly like the first slide I had here. So it's not that good. Because we want resize to work. So what's the next step we take as a typical web designer? Okay, we make it relative to height. It can't be 50%, so we make it 47% because then it looks nice. Yes. 
really nice when we resize the layout a little bit and notice that oh the six percent that we calculated it's not very good anymore this is actually something that has been used in many or is used in many places i've seen body applications done like this uh, there's some problem with scroll bars so instead of 100 percent width we set 99 percent width or 98 and all the problems disappear and everybody's happy it can be a good solution uh, it can also be a really bad solution so how should we really solve this Uh, if we don't, if we can change the DOM structure, this is easy. We can add a lot of divs and make it nice and so. But if we can only add CSS, uh, well, we can use some ugly CSS like this. This actually works in all browsers except IE8. So, and this is exactly what we want. We want the height to be 50% and then we want to reduce half of the spacing between the divs and then also the border pixels. And it will work and you can resize it and it will follow really nicely. So, this is one solution. Uh, of course, if you want to support IE8, you can't use it. So then you're back to square one again and need to figure out something else. Uh, but luckily there's, there are, as in, with HTML, there's only, always many solutions, typically one even more hacky than another one. But uh, in this case, for instance, we can also solve it like this. Just add some extra bottom padding to the main container div. Everything will work nicely. So what, what we actually do here is we make the bottom padding double as high. So uh, if we just added the padding and the two divs, they would be to get put together uh, with no spacing in between them and a double spacing at the bottom. But then we have the margin top 15 pixels here, which move down the second div and we will actually get what we want. And it works in all browsers. So it's a nice solution. Mm. So, what's really the problem here? We have a solution. Uh, well, this becomes uh, a bit tricky when you don't know that margin top is 15 pixels. It can be 14, or it can be 24, or 1500. Because if you don't know this, then it's pretty hard to know what you have to add as some extra bottom padding or some other hack you're using somewhere. What you should write in your calc statement. So, then you have a problem. And the question is, how, how do you solve this problem? In a generic way, so it just works. And, okay, I've... I haven't said anything about Vadin this far. And, uh, well, it's not really a Vadin problem I'm talking about either. This is a problem that you, well, you could ask, of course, isn't it a problem that everybody faces that uses HTML? And, well, the, the answer to this is really no, because if you're doing a web page, you know that the, bar, the border is 1 pixels. You know that the padding is 15 pixels. You have full control over the web page. So you can just specify that, hey, this header here, I declare this to be 100 pixels. And nobody can argue against you because you have full control. So then the header is 100 pixels and you add your padding accordingly. Now the problem comes when you try to do reusable components because the reusable components really have no control over how high the header is or really anything else either outside the component. So it would be pretty strange if in the Vardin application your label in your pers person edit view could suddenly declare that the menu bar is always 50 pixels. 
and then everything would revolve around that. Then it's 50 pixels, OK. But no, in reality, it doesn't work that way. The component can only affect itself. So uh, what we really need to do is, as you can't know this stuff, uh, we have to find out the stuff. So how big is the border? Well, it could be 15 pixels. Could be 30, so we have to measure it. And then we have to do the calculations ourselves. And then we have the up update based on the results of our calculations. And well, the case seen this way, it would be nice to write just something. It would be nice if uh, you could write CSS, even if you could use calc in CSS and just say that, OK, we calculate 50% uh, minus the border of this element. But no, that's not possible. Then it would be easily solved. We would not need uh, this presentation even, because there wouldn't be any problem. No, you can't do that. And actually, when we start measuring, we start calculating, we start updating the sizes ourselves. Uh, what we really need in a framework like Vardin, you have components. What you really need is resize events. Because, yes, you can calculate everything once. Typically in a Vardin application, whenever the user clicks a button the first time, the second time, sometime, you remove all components, add some other components, and it will be all messed up and you need to recalculate the layout because the border that was five pixels isn't there anymore. So once, I mean, if we stick to CSS, this is nice because the browser takes care of whenever this needs to be recalculated. But uh, if we do anything ourselves, we need really the resize events for the elements we are calculating. And there's a slight issue, of course, that you don't get any resize events, uh, except for IE, because IE is really the best browser around. And it has, for many, many versions, already supported on resize for any element in the DOM. But, well, when you want to support the other browsers, the, let's call them non-standard browsers, uh, then you have to do something else. So this is basically the problem. How do we solve it? How do we get resize events? How can we do layouting manually when the browser can't do it properly? Uh, we have now seen that, well, at least based on this, HTML doesn't really provide any means to do it. If you have some good solutions, how to do this with purely HTML, CSS, I would gladly hear them. Uh, and I don't want to hear the IE expressions. It's just as bad as calc, except it's even deprecated nowadays. It's even removed from IE8. So. But any other suggestions? Because if you have good suggestions, I can just stop here. There's no need to continue with anything else. OK, so, uh, well, Vadim builds upon GWT. So surely GWT solves this problem if HTML doesn't solve it. It's only natural, right? And um, actually, GWT has a solution for this problem. Starting from GWT 2.0, there's this thing called provides resize and requires resize that you can use in your widgets. And as the specification says, requires resize, it's really what we need on resize. It's a method that's called when the element is resized. 
the interface designates that its implementer needs to be informed whenever its size is modified. And that's exactly what we're looking for. So we know when, when the, the size has changed, we can recalculate something, for instance. I mean, the real problem here, typical problem here, is that the outer size, the size of your root element changes, let's say. And you have to do some calculations inside this, like the container uh, example with two 50% wide uh, high and 100% wide divs, for instance. So you need to have the resize for the root element. Based on that, you calculate something for the internals. And this is exactly on resize. Awesome. The other interface is an empty marker interface, provides resize. It's only a tagging interface that says this widget will actually call on resize for its children. OK, cool. So, uh, well, if we have a widget that requires resize, we add it inside a parent which doesn't implement provides resize, we won't get any resize events. Oh, well, that sucks. But sure, we can see that the parent implement provides resize. And we'll get the resize events. Um, slight problem becomes, OK, well, th so this is basically what WIT provides. Something originated from somewhere up in the hierarchy, and then it will go down through the hierarchy. So because when the parent changes, it will inform the children. Or when the parent does something that might affect the size of the children, it will inform, inform the children. And then they will inform their children and so on. And yeah, still sounds pretty nice. Of course, as I said, if the parent doesn't implement provides resize, mm, well, this won't help you. Because really nobody will call on resize. You can call it yourself, but doesn't make sense. Uh, the other case is, of course, that if a child is resized and the parent is affected by this, what happens then? Well, it's not specified in any way that the child can say anything to the parent. It's always the parent that informs its children. So you're kind of out of luck there. And the third thing is, how do you implement provides resize? If you make something that contains widgets, uh, when do you call actually on resize for the children? Sure, if somebody calls set width, set height, that's pretty natural. The height or the width changes. So you call on resize for all your children. Everything works. Uh, typically, you really, before you attach the, the DOM, you're not really sure of your size. So it might make sense to call on resize in attach. And of course, if your style name changes, because the size can come from CSS rules. So if your style name changes, it might affect the children or yourself. So you call on resize. Uh, but then comes the problems that something in the DOM hierarchy changes, which is not in your control. You have a parent style name that changes. And this changes your width. Uh, how do you know this? You won't get any events. If it changes the size of a parent widget, then you will get an event because this provided this implement provides resize. You will get an event that will propagate downwards. But if it only affects you, how do you know? Well, you can have a timer that's polling every now and then and see what the size is. Sure, but then you don't need on resize events. You can just pull every element in the DOM and act accordingly whenever you need. Or the child can pull itself, like, is my size the same as before? Not very efficient to do for many elements. So this is basically what WIT provides, and it doesn't really solve our problem. Yes, it provides the interface, it provides the means, but there's no solution how to even implement the interface. So, 
for the sake of history, let's say a few words about Vardin 6 also. Vardin 6 has an implementation. Well, it tries to solve this problem. And it solves this problem with certain limitations. And the way it was solved in Vardin 6, well, there are many reasons why it was solved the way it was. But what is 6 basically does everything itself. It calculates everything. It doesn't even allow you to put percentages in the DOM. Which is, well, for some cases it's nice. For styling it's really not nice when there's, there's pixels and pixels and pixels everywhere. And, well, basically because it sets pixels everywhere, it has to have resize events because even 100% width wouldn't work without this because when you resize the browser you have to resize everything that's 100% recalculate layouts and so on and so on. Now this uh, wasn't implemented in Vardin 6 really to solve the resize problem. It was more implemented to solve the IE6 problem. Because when you calculate everything yourself, you have full control over how things look and where things end up. And in IE6, you don't really have enough CSS to support to build something like our vertical layouts or grid layouts or basically any more complex layout. So you need, but anyway, yeah, you need resource events. How do you get resource events in Vardin 6? Uh, well, in Vardin 6 is kind of built in into the widgets, which are also paintables. So it, well, there's only one place you can put it. So it's in that place. It's in the widget paintable. And uh, there it works such that you call set width for a widget. And the widget implementation or the component realizes, well, it can do some checking. Does, does this really affect my width? Typically, it originates from a server message. And the server message can just reset and reset and reset the same width over and over again. So it, the widgets kind of optimize this by checking, did it affect me? If it didn't, they do nothing. If it really affected them, uh, then they propagate this event to their children. Hey, my size changed. It might affect you as well. Actually, it's not only that because of the handling of percentage sizes. It's actually the responsibility of a parent to recalculate the size of the child and set the width for this child. So if the child is 100%, we have to recalculate that based on the new parent size for which there's this nice get allocated space method in Vardin 6. So that get allocated space is basically like how much space is there available for this child widget. And every, every implementation, widget implementation, component, container implementation in Vardin 6 has to be able to answer this question. So typically it's implemented in Vardin 6 so that you have some slot where the child will go and you just measure the slot. Okay, this much space is available for you. And then uh, it, it will end up setting that exact width to the child widget. So it feels nicely slot and 100% uh, works to the end user in the way the end user expects it to work. So this is, well, basically what Gwit also offers, something that goes down in the hierarchy. Whenever the parent changes, the child changes. Uh, then there's another feature in Vardin 6. It's, there's this container interface which all widgets that contain widgets should implement, and there's a method called request layout. Basically, the feature is that the child widgets, whenever they change, they should call the parent and say request layout. 
So basically, it's a way to propagate the size change upwards in the hierarchy. Hey, my size, ha my size might have changed. Uh, please check if you need to do something. So it's a non-resize in the other direction, pretty much. Mm. To be a bit efficient, this is typically done even lazily in Vardin 6, because when you render a lot of widgets, they will see, hey, my size has changed, and they will all tell the parent, hey, my size has changed, my size has changed. So this uh, is a bit lazy just to get these, group these together, all events, so the parent can in a bit more sensible way react to this, like, okay, I need to recalculate my layout, fine, I know, I know, yes, you have changed, you have changed, you have changed, yes, relax, I'll just do this once. Mm. Of course, you might have the case that the child has changed and that affects the parent, and then the parent size changes and that affects the child, another child, and then this affects again something else and something else. But this is Vardin 6. There, there's also another feature in Vardin 6. It's called Container Resize Listener, which contains a method iLayout. And uh, this is basically exactly the same as Quit provides, except that uh, Quit didn't provide this when we made Vardin 6. So it basically requires resize on resize, uh, without any interface specifying who calls this. But this is also the responsibility of the parent to call this whenever its size has changed, in addition to updating the size of a relative child, and so on. Uh, really, I would say this interface, it was, it was introduced in 5-something, uh, where there were some different ideas on how to solve this problem. And then, in the end, we went to this calculate everything as pixels to deal with IS6, and then the interface, it, well, it just kind of hang around. And it wasn't really used. I think it was, is used today even for some components, mainly because they haven't been migrated to this. The new way of doing it, so just reacting to set width, set height. Those were actually removed in Vardin 7, and I think it was like maybe two components where it was actually done. So all the others didn't use it, but then there were yeah. a few that, that used it. So. Right, so uh, why did we remove this from Vardin 7? <laughs> why isn't this good? It solves the problem. The, Events go down in the hierarchy, the events go up in the hierarchy. There are, well, there are some issues here. There are many issues here. Uh, one issue is uh, when you react to this, this size change in set width, set height, if both dimensions change, what do you do? Well, you do everything two times. Because when set width is called, you have actually no idea if set height will be called afterwards or not. And so instead of having this on resize or I layout where you could do things once, we moved to the pattern where you have two methods and need to do the same things basically in both. Except for some very rare cases where you do different things in the horizontal and the vertical direction. Those are not very common. And, well, there are other drawbacks with this approach. For instance, it's slow. The browsers can do calculations much faster than you can do in JavaScript. Well, oh, surprise. So it's, a, it's better to let the browser do it, but here the browser wasn't allowed to do anything. And also, what made things maybe even worse is that when there was a server message coming in in Vardin 6, 
you would have the update, update for one component and then an update for another component and for a third and so on and so on. Well, the update for the first component would update the state for the first component and call set width and set height for it. And this would, of course, trigger some uh, measuring and see, checking that, okay, is this okay? Should I tell my children about this? The children, the child widgets maybe started measuring and checking something also and so on and so on. And then you get to updating the second component and they start updating the DOM again for the second component. And then you get set with set height, and then you do measuring, and then you update, and then you measure. And well, the browsers don't really like this because whenever you update the DOM and then you measure something from the DOM, they have to recalculate how the layout really, or what the layout really is. So what is really the size of this element? They, the browsers do it lazily always. So. If nobody asks for the size, well, why calculate it? We can do it later if somebody needs it. Well, of course, uh, to put the <coughs> end result on the, in the browser, you need to calculate the size. But that's just one time. Here, uh, you would have multiple calculations during each update. So this is what's shown in this graph down here. It's from Speed Tracer in Chrome. So basically the yellow part that's javascript executing updating stuff then you have the purple part that's the browser doing layouting so layout or reflow so recalculating size of things and the green part which is pretty much visible also is style recalculations I don't know, I don't remember what example this is from exactly, but it's some typical update in a Vadim 6 application. So you have JavaScript, reflow, JavaScript, reflow, style updates, JavaScript, reflow, JavaScript, reflow, and so on. And what you would really like to have here is a huge yellow bar, okay, actually a small yellow bar, <laughs> and then the purple bar, and well, the green bar comes somewhere in between those, but anyway, you don't want them split up this way because then the browser is doing a lot of extra work. Uh, also, well, there wasn't really any or that much helper methods for this in Vadim 6. So you kind of ended up implementing this in all widgets, all container widgets. And uh, for some reason, the implementation was a bit different in all, all of the container widgets. Nobody had learned copy-paste. It was copy-paste and modify or something like this. So it's, well, partly it's kind of a mess, the code, and it's not really easy to understand. Uh, the set width method could be 50 lines of code when well, logically what it should do is set the width in the DOM, but here's all kinds of logic, or is still. And, well, of course, style name changes. Yeah, who cares? Style name changes, yeah? Then it changes. Oh, that affects the width. Well, that's your problem. So, even if you change the style name, of the component, it might not work, so it might not recalculate the layouts. If the style name adds borders or padding or whatever. Uh, not even speaking about adding style name to a parent somewhere. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's just keep on doing the same. Sure, it will be fine. So it, there's no dynamic style updates in that way that affects the size. Some components may support it, but then they have some special support implemented. Right, that was the history lesson. Now we get to the awesome part, because of course what in 7 there is implemented in an awesome way. We'll get to the drawbacks of that later. 
anyway, Vadim 7 has a different, slightly different approach to this than Vadim 6, or a totally different approach. So the Vadim 7 approach is we don't want to do any calculations. Use CSS. Let the browser do it. It's not our job. Um, well, the problem is you can't ignore it completely. Because you're pretty, if you try to create the new grid we are working on at the moment, for instance, and try to do this purely using CSS, you're, well, you're going to have a hard time. Especially when you start adding features like lazy loading. The DOM in the grid, the, it uses escalator pattern, so it has only like 20 rows in the DOM at a time, and then it reuses these DOM elements. Okay, this is not exactly layouting when you scroll, but it kind of is anyway. So you have to do calculations. If you resize the table, mm, what should happen to the column widths? Well, sure, you can fix them, and then you'll have, again, something a bit like the first example here, that you resize the grid, and the columns stay the same, and you get a lot of white space at the right end. Might work, might not be the best solution. And also we have, well, we have components you can't implement using purely HTML. Most uh, component containers, well, CSS layout, that's easy to implement without any special hacks. But uh, grid layout, it's based on an absolute layout where you absolutely position elements, calculate yourself. It supports all kinds of row spans and call spans and lots of stuff you can't really do using pure CSS. So, uh, the Vardin 7 approach, let's just, whatever the server says, let's put it in the DOM. Sure, it will be fine. But then we need something to, still a way to deal with resize events, to be able to recalculate the inner layouts of components. So, how do we do this? I layout, set width, set height. No, we need a new concept. So let's call it Layout Manager. Layout Manager is really the core of layouting in Vadim 7. It's the one who takes responsibility for the layout. It's no longer the responsibility of each individual widget container. So what does the Layout Manager do? Well, it, it handles tracking of what needs to be measured. And it actually does measuring of what needs to be measured. What it... Actually, I should skip a few slides ahead to explain this more easily, but uh, okay, let's not do that. So, it tracks what needs to be measured. It tracks what needs layouting. Basically, it tracks the whole hierarchy that you that is currently visible on the client side, and and keeps book of what should be done and what has happened. And it's on this layout manager's responsibility to provide these resize events. Uh, the layout manager is built on top of connectors, not widgets, which is kind of a, I would say, questionable decision. It, it was made in during the beginning of the Vadin 7 project, and there wasn't as much concern about doing stuff on the client side. The mindset was pretty much still at, we're doing server side and they should handle layouting of the connectors. Well, 
Sure. Or, okay, component connectors. We're not talking extensions or anything like that here. But, uh, yeah, we can just as well build it on top of connectors because you always have your connector and then you have your widget. Well, when you talk about now doing client-side stuff, it's a bit stupid because you don't have connectors. And this means the layout manager today won't really handle that case when you when you're just on the client side and combining widgets. I think this is something we have to revisit pretty soon, especially for new grid builds upon this, that it needs resize events. Then mm, we might need to refactor this a bit. But that's how it works today. The reason, why, why does it build upon connectors? There are reasons. One reason is uh, Vardin has this concept of undefined size, which means basically use the content, take the size of the content and let that affect your size. So the child affects the parent. This is basically the reason also why we need resize events that propagate upwards in the hierarchy. If the child can never affect the size of the parent, why would you need events going upwards? Well, you don't. Typically, you, well, if you have a grid application, I guess you set this size for, well, pretty much everything. It's 100% or it's fixed and it's natural that it goes downwards. But this undefined size, is really the need for it going upwards. And it's, well, it's one of the reasons why it's built on top of connectors, because the connector has either a relative size, a fixed size, or an undefined size. And, well, if you look in the DOM, and you see in the DOM it's specified that it's 500 pixels. Is this the undefined size, and someone has just set it to 500 pixels in the DOM? to make it that size, or is it actually set to 500 pixels? So this is something that the layout manager then can take into account when it does layouting, because if the child changes and the parent is 500 pixels, well, the parent probably doesn't care that the child changes. It doesn't affect its width. But if the child changes and the parent is undefined, then it probably has to do some layouting. Uh, the final reason for layout manager, it tries to solve the problem with set width, set height, <clears throat> and every component doing layout calculations more or less by hand. So it batches together measuring and layouting. So it, we get rid of the yellow, blue, yellow, purple, yellow, purple, yellow, purple in this figure. and. It <coughs> aims instead that you can have a lot of JavaScript processing going on and then we measure and then we lay out and we're pretty much done after that. Yeah, that's not really how it goes all the time, but that's the idea. Uh, so what does Layout Manager provide for you? Well, you, have, uh, you as a connector have the possibility to indicate that you're interested in layout events. There are different ways of doing this. Uh, we have something called simple managed layout. This is really requ uh, requires resize. And the layout method is on resize because it's a method that's called whenever layout manager feels like something has happened that <clears throat> might require the connector or the widget to be the size to be recalculated. So it's, well, it's not specified what has happened and it's not specified that the layout is really not up to date. It's just that to, I, I guess you need the layout now. Something happened that might affect it. 
there's a specialized version of the managed layout also called directional managed layout. Uh, if you use this, you're really advanced. And, or really, really advanced. I'm not even sure if we use it that yeah. much in a couple of components, maybe. Oh, yeah. Uh, so the difference between di directional managed layout and simple managed layout is you get separate events for when you need to do layout horizontally or vertically. It can enable you to optimize some things and it can be pretty confusing. Uh, if you're making a horizontal layout, maybe we would need layout horizontally. If you make a panel, don't use directional managed layout. But you have the freedom to choose. Do you want one event or two events? The layout manager is able to detect that, okay, there has been only changes in the horizontal direction, so you only need to lay out horizontally. Uh, it's also able to detect that, oh, there were horizontal changes that will affect this vertically, and then it will call the correct method. So it's, well, the logic there, what to do and when, it's pretty advanced. Let's get into that in a bit. Uh, we also have post layout listener, which is really, well, it's more of an event when layouting has completed. What do you do in a post layout listener? What do we do in post layout listeners? Mm, we do some ugly hacks in table to make it free layout again because we know it went wrong the first time. That's really not the <laughs> main use case for post layout listeners. But, well, whatever you need, an event when the layout phase is completed, you know at this point that uh, the DOM has been updated, sizes are correct, and so on. What will happen typically next is the, the newly layout. DOM will be shown to the user. So yes, if you want in a post layout, you start the new layout phase and then you do everything again. But don't do that. And the final feature that the connectors can use is a resize listener. So what's a resize listener? Wasn't that simple managed layout and directional managed layout? Yeah, it's pretty close and a bit similar, but not really. So a resize listener, uh, it's a resize listener for an element. It's re this is really the resize event that we are looking for. So the connectors can freely add resize listeners to any element in the DOM. And the layout manager will take care of measuring these elements, finding out whenever they change, and send a resize event to the one listening to them. There are some limitations here. Mm. We'll get to that, those also in a bit. There's always limitations. So what does layouting really mean here? What does the layout manager do? Well, the layout manager's manager lays out uh, internally, it's in every layout, when the layout starts, uh, it starts by building a dependency tree. What do we need to measure? What do we need to lay out? What, what should we actually do? Uh, because, sure, we can say, let's do everything. Measure the whole DOM and then call layout for everything until it looks nice but it's not really efficient. So it does a pretty advanced dependency tree analyze and sees, fi basically finds out how the sizes of various components affect the sizes of other components and in which direction will affect which other direction and so on and so on. So after this, it knows what do we need to measure. And what does it do next? Measures those things? Of course not. Uh, 
it only measures elements uh, which are not the root of any widgets. And uh, why does it do this? And because um, it assumes that the size of these elements won't change during this layout phase. So it actually measures them only once. Uh, after this we get to a loop which does sub or well let's call them layout phases as they are called in the code. So it loops doing layout phases until everything sta stabilizes and nobody wants to update their, their sizes anymore. So uh, well maybe it should measure the elements inside this loop. Currently it measures them outside the loop and assumes that it will be okay. So when you get in the loop there you actually measure then the root of all the widgets. You, you fire uh, resize events for whatever you notice have changed. I guess this goes for the first measured elements as well as the connectors you have measured at this point. So after you have measured, you start calling these layout methods for the managed layouts, no matter if they are directional or simple. Well, actually, it does layout first in the horizontal direction, then in the vertical direction. Why this way? Why not the other way? because typically the horizontal direction can affect the vertical direction. For instance, when you have a label with an undefined amount of lorem ipsum, uh, the width of the label affects how it will wrap and how high the label will be. So it does horizontal layouting and then it does vertical layouting. If it's if there are simple managed layouts included here, it just layouts them also whenever needed. And well, it keeps looping here. Basically until it notices that, okay, this changed during the last the layout calls to various managed layouts uh, during uh, element resize listeners they change, okay, we do another loop, and we do another loop. And then at some point you get to this case that nothing changes. When you measure the change connectors, they all have the same sizes. Then you're done. Then all it, what's remaining is call post layout listeners to let them know that layout has been performed. And if there's a table here, then you start all over again once more. That's a different story. Uh, yeah, how many of you understand Layout Manager now? One, but you created it. <laughs> no, I finally understand it. <laughs> no, I interesting, interesting. Oh. Uh, so a small example how layouting goes. If we have a case like this in Vardin, we have a vertical layout here. Well, auto means undefined here, basically the same thing. So we have a really especially tricky case here where we have a vertical layout with a fixed height, undefined width. It contains a label that's 100% wide and undefined height. And then we also have a button that's undefined wide and 100% height. And well, let's say the button still has an expand ratio of one. So how does layout or the vertical layout and the layout manager deal with this? Well, you start by creating the dependency tree. So what depends on what here? Mm. Well, the layout should be undefined, so it depends on its content. And the label should be 100%, so it depends on the layout size, the width. And then 
Okay, then you have the undefined bottom, so it means it depends on the length of its caption. Mm, but then you have also have the height, where the label height actually depends on the label width, so that depends on the vertical layout width. And, well, the button height, that's 100%, but, uh, and it should be expanded, so that depends on how high the label actually will be, so then you can see what remains of the vertical layout, and then you can put the button there. So it's a really simple case, it's basic, 101 layouting. Everything depends on everything. Uh, or actually, if you sort the dependencies, you can see that we actually have a chain of dependencies here. Button height depends on label height. Label height depends on label width. Label width depends on vertical layout width. The vertical layout width depends on the button width. And the button width depends on the button capture. And this is basically what Layout Manager does internally. So now Layout Manager knows that <clears throat> What, where should we start? Well, a good place to start would be with the button width, because we know the button caption, and so we can measure the button width to see how wide the button actually is. And then we can start going backwards through this dependency chain. So what will it do in the browser? It will render this well, the user won't see it, but it will render the layout something like this, just so it can measure the button width. Uh, then it has the dependency that says that the button width, uh, it will affect the layouting of the vertical layout. So the next step would be for the layout managers to call the layout methods of vertical layout. Uh, now, if vertical layout is a directional managed layout, so it handles horizontally and vertically separately, what would this call? Uh, horizontal, probably, because it's the width that affects the width of the vertical layout. If it's a simple managed layout, well, it calls layout. So, now the vertical layout layout method will be called and the vertical layout will see that okay I'm supposed to be undefined wide so I need to calculate my width. I have two children, I have a button, it hasn't a relative width so it will affect my own width and I have a label that's 100% wide so that won't affect my width. So okay let's just take whatever the button width add the margins that I have defined and let's set the width to that. And you get <coughs> the layout rendered like this. But this is not really the layout we wanted yet. So when you continue upwards in the dependency chain, you get to measure label height. Because now when you have set the vertical layout width, you know that this has changed also the label width, that's 100%. Now we need to know what height the label turned out, so we can set the height of the button. And, well, as label is not a simple managed layout or any managed layout, it won't call any layout functions for that. It will just measure the height of the label. And then it will call layout for the vertical layout again. Layout vertically, this time. It, as it's a di directional managed layout. And the vertical layout now, once again, does layouting and sees that, okay, the button height should be this. So it sets the height, or it actually creates a slot or sets the height on the slot for the button, so that the button becomes the correct height. Pretty simple. Straightforward. Of course, this is not the way vertical layout works. 
because it's not implemented this way. It's not a managed layout. Vertical layout uses resource listeners. Does this make sense to anybody? Don't answer. There is actually a reason for this. Let's get to that in a while. Right. Let's continue with another example of how vertical layout actually works. The same example with the real vertical layout using resize listeners. <clears throat> It goes like this. Start, basically, it starts the same way. We just put something in the DOM and then we start measuring. Uh, in this case, we have a resource listener on each child, which means that <clears throat> instead of one layout call, the vertical layout would get two resize events. Uh, it's a bit similar to the problem with set width, set height in Vardin 6 in the sense that it gets two events and it doesn't know that when it gets the first event that it will get the second event right after the first event. So, <clears throat> well, what does it mean? It will get a resize event for a button and it will see that, okay, now I know enough so I can set the width of the vertical layout just as before. Mm. Then it will get a resize event for the label that says, okay, the label is of this size. Fine, now we know the label height. So we can actually calculate the button height because uh, in the other case, this was what we just wanted. Uh, the button width, it defines the vertical layout width. Then we adjusted the vertical layout width so we get the correct wrapping for the label. And then we get an event that the label size is this, and then we do the final layouting. Uh, the only problem here is that the label isn't of correct size at this point, but the vertical layout doesn't know that. So it will actually do a layouting like this. Uh, doesn't look exactly right. But <clears throat> after this, uh, it will get a new resize event because once the vertical layout width has been set, the label will actually wrap, which will trigger a resize event. So the layout manager measures the label, sends a resize event. So now we can set uh, the button height after this because when we get the event, we have this situation which isn't really optimal. It looks a bit like some early example I had here. So it still needs to set the button height correctly afterwards. So who can tell me why vertical layout uses resize listeners? Is it to get this one extra operation here when it incorrectly sets the size? Uh, no, there's one good reason to why it does this, and <coughs> it's that vertical layout and horizontal layout. <coughs> Let me just mute Jonas here. Okay, good. Uh, vertical layout and horizontal layout, those were recreated for Vardin 7 in such a way that they can <coughs> handle most of the cases without doing any layout calculations. <clears throat> it also depends a bit on which browser you're using, <coughs> i.e. So uh, if you are implementing a simple managed directional a simple managed layout or the directional version, you always get the layout events. And the layout manager will take care of some things for you, like saying measuring, calling layout and so on. It's, it can be really good, uh, but in the case where you don't want to do any explicit layouting, 
you will still get these calls and you will still do some work. So using the resize listeners, it allows the vertical layout, horizontal layout to be more selective about when to do layouting. So basically the resize listeners check is the layout configured in this and this and this and this way. Okay, then we need to do something. Uh, is it configured in any other way? Just ignore the event. Because Just remove the resource listeners. Or remove the resource listeners, yeah. Well, <clears throat> anyway, it allows it to be fast and be based on HTML and CSS in most cases. And that's, that's a real reason why it's not a managed layout. Uh, a few other things Layout Manager provides. It provides measurements. This is, well, I know yesterday somebody was just trying to figure out here how do I get the border size here and how do I get this to fit into that and I need to calculate and measure this and that. Well, the Layout Manager, it will provide for all the elements it's measure, it will also provide uh, features like the border, margin, padding, outer width, inner width, well, outer width basically is inner width plus all the border, margin and padding. And uh, these will be really fast operations that you can use in your layout method because they are already calculated or measured when the layout manager measured the elements. So they are just there for you to use. And you might very well need those when you do some funky layout stuff. Mm. So how does this work when you combine it or with a server? Or the question maybe is, when is the layout manager actually used? When does layouting happen? Uh, well, one place where layouting happens is at the end of each server message. There's basically everything takes place, updating states, updating hierarchy, sending the state events, uh, state change listeners will react to the events, update the DOM maybe, update whatever they update. <clears throat> there are the hierarchy change events, the legacy update from UIDL calls will be done. When everything is done, then it will, as the last phase, do layouting. Because then you have all the DOM updates done before starting to measuring. So you get rid of those interleaved measuring and updating phases. There are a few issues here. For instance, if you have a legacy component with update from UIDL, it might very well measure something within that, that method. And that's not the optimal way of doing it. You might also have written a state change handler <coughs> which does measuring, which you shouldn't do because it's not the optimal way of doing it. So really you should try to <coughs> move the layouting to the layout phase and use the resource listeners or the managed layout. Uh, of course, it's not enough to trigger this when you have a server message. Uh, there are other things, well, mainly browser window resize. It's actually a resize event that every, every browser provides for the browser window, not for any other element. So that obviously triggers, <coughs> triggers layouting. Um, well, actually, the server message layouting, it's a bit different than other layouting. Because when the server message has been handled, it measures everything. It ignores all the old measurements and remeasures all the elements that it needs to measure or that <clears throat> either have element precise listeners or they are managed layouts or there's any other reason to measure them. Why does it do this? Uh, because it doesn't know. <clears throat> it doesn't know what the update from the server has done. 
if the update from the server set the style name on the UI and this alters the width, the size of some component. There's no way of knowing this because it could affect any widget in the hierarchy. So it remeasures everything. <clears throat> it's not as bad as it sounds because all the measurements happen at the same time. So the browser really it has to do one reflow <clears throat> and calculate the sizes and then just provide them to layout manager. But this is the way that layout manager can determine that okay there was a style change on the UI or whatever I don't know even what change it changed but this element changed size here's a resize event. Uh, okay the final way is to trigger a layout phase calling some layout manager methods. Uh, you might have of course the situation that the user does something and this requires re-layouting something else or something. So if you can have the, well, you have the button and you, a button and you click on a button and it should change the size of the button. Well, then it needs to call layout manager and tell, tell layout managers that the layout manager that it needs to re-measure the button. And as a consequence of this, the layout manager will start layouting if it notices the button size has changed and so on and so on. Then it will go through all this layouting again. There are also some methods in layout manager to force it to do this. It's force layout mainly. Uh, but there's also layout later and layout now. I guess typically you shouldn't need these methods. You should only use, say that, hey, we need to measure this, and then things happen. Could be any of one of those cases when somebody asks the server that CSS uh, as images and those images load slowly and after they have reloaded, then that actually changes the content. If you're using Yeah, you need to handle that yourself somehow. Uh, if there are something like image onload events for well icons in captions or something embedded embedding some image, these are handled by the framework, but Yes, I'm sure you can come up with some case where you can do something that actually affects the layout and this won't automatically pick it up. But then you always have the possibility to, <clears throat> when you, if you know this event happens, you can tell the layout manager about it and it will relay out. Yeah, this is basically a layout manager. Now the question is, uh, when you do a Vadim widget, a Vadim component, how, how should you do the layouting? What should you use? And it's a really simple answer to that. If you don't, if you somehow manage to do it using HTML and CSS, that's absolutely the best way. You don't have any layout manager to worry about. You don't need to implement layout methods. You don't need to handle some updating of the sizes in your widgets. It just works because the browser takes care of it. Uh, I have another example here of a slightly different layout but slightly similar to the older example. If you want to create a pop-up date field you want it basically to be a button to the right that opens some kind of pop-up and then you want the text field that uses the rest of the space available. Okay, here we have defined also that it should be 300 pixels wide. In Vardin contents, of course, the width comes from the server. 
<coughs> or from the user. Uh, anyway, how would you do this using HTML and CSS? Pretty straightforward, same way as we did before, a container div containing an input element and a div which is the button, set the width of the container to 300 pixels, uh, yeah, and some padding so that <coughs> we can say the field that it's 100% wide and it will not use everything with padding, we can restrict the size of what, or we can restrict what 100% means for the child widget. And then we add a 30 pixel button to the right, button to the right. And we get this result. Uh, we get something that's 340 pixels wide. And <coughs> the actual input field already is 306 pixels. So what, we did, what did we do wrong here? Well, it's something that one of the issues is related to box sizing. There are two way, ways of defining sizes in HTML. You have the content box and the border box. And what this tells is really that when you say with 300 pixels, what becomes 300 pixels? If you're using content box sizing, then it means the actual element becomes 300 pixels and then you add padding and border on top of that. Uh, if you use border box sizing you, and you say 300 pixels width, you define that the content and the padding and the border all together should be 300 pixels. Uh, when doing layouting, like we do in Vaadin, the border box makes much more sense because then you set, <coughs> you set a width to something and the component actually becomes that wide. Uh, with content box it's always, well, you set the width and it becomes something else. And this is what's hap what happened here in this example also because content box, well, in HTML content box is the default. In Vaadin actually, border box is specified to be default for all widgets. So you will actually automatically get border box. So we fix this by setting border box here. And we still have a slightly broken component. So what's this related to? The, <coughs> the root div here is 300 pixels, but then there's a four pixel spacing between the field and the button div. Well, at least the solution is really obvious. We change the HTML so it doesn't contain white space. And then we get the widget that we want. And somebody may ask what the... But it's really obvious. We have set the button here to be an inline block. And uh, the field is an in inline element, which means it's really like writing text. So if you put a space between two words, then you want some spacing in between. So put an inline element and an inline block and space in between in the HTML and you get spacing in between. Uh, Just as a curiosity, this is, uh, there's a similar issue to this in Internet Explorer, which forces us to set font size zero for all container elements in Vaadin, because, <clears throat> well, this spacing between the elements, it's relative to the font size because it's a white space. And if you set font size to zero, you could solve this by setting font size to zero zero also. You have to reset it for the field, of course, because otherwise what you type in the field will be pretty small. Uh, <clears throat> but if you set font size zero here for the container, you'll get rid of the space. Okay, in this case you can solve it easily by removing the white space, but there's this feature in Internet Explorer that sometimes you can't remove this extra space. So in Vaadin it's solved by adding font size zero 
to every element basically that con can contain scroll bars. Because if you put something inside that's 100% times 100%, and uh, Internet Explorer will add four more pixels at the bottom, you will also have, always have scroll bars. Which is not nice. Uh, <clears throat> if we still evolve our pop-up date field a bit, Biden supports undefined size. So, well, what does it mean for a pop-up date field? Mm, you could say that it means, for instance, use whatever default size on the input text field that the browser provides and then add a button to the right and let's call that undefined. Uh, how do you implement this? Yes, you make it a simple managed layout and then you start making if sentences and so on. That's one way. Uh, but to help deal with this, you get some class names added to your widget in Vardin also, depending on if it's undefined size or not. So if it doesn't have undefined size, Vardin will add we has width or we has height to your widget. So if you want to style the widget differently, make it look differently based if it's undefined style or not, you can use these. So to support undefined size in our widget, we could just move this padding part that we have, the 100% width for the field. We can just add this we has width rule to them. So they will only be applied when there's a specific width set on the component. Of course, the width 300 pixels here, it's not something you would typically add that comes from the server. Uh, but this way you have a component without any layout logic that works both as undefined and with a defined width. <clears throat> the text field will expand when it has a defined width and otherwise it will be the default width. Nice. Uh, of course, if the button, we specified once again here, we know that the button is 30 pixels wide. If that can change during runtime, well, you're out of luck, then you have to use a resize listener or implement managed layout. But even to do that, that's not very tricky for these kind of component. So if you want to use a resize listener, <coughs> uh, what you need to do, add a resize listener uh, when you initialize the connector. Well, it's a good way, good thing to remove the element resize listener when you, the connector is unregistered. Otherwise you will leak memory in the browser. And then you have an element resize listener that looks something like this. It's basically the same thing that we did just a minute ago in CSS. Now it's in Java code. Uh, we have the on element resize, which layout manager will call for us. This element resize, it will simply get the outer width of this button element, which is on the right bar, right hand side of the component. Uh, the outer width, it's the width of the button plus border padding margin. We don't want the margin uh, there, so we subtract that, get <coughs> the border box of the button. So then we can just adjust the padding of this root element to match this the button size, whatever it has become now. Uh, to support undefined width, again, we need to have a special case for that where, well, if we have undefined width, we don't have any padding, we just have elements one after each other. So then we just remove the padding. The, this is also needed if the, if you allow the user to change between a fixed width and an undefined width, 
then the component will have a padding when we get here, and then we need to remove that padding. Otherwise, it won't look right. Uh, of course, we can do the same thing as a simple managed layout. Uh, <coughs> well, instead of using add element resize listener, uh, we have to do something uh, in our init method. Uh, I mean, our connector here implements simple managed layout. And this is actually enough, if we look at this, uh, this is enough for the layout method to be called in the connector. And well, the layout method, it should do exactly the same thing as the resource listener does, because it's just a different way of implementing this. Uh, but when we do it as a simple managed layout, the layout manager will automatically measure the element, the root element of whatever implements simple managed layout. Uh, but in this case, we are interested in the button part of the component changing size. And this won't be automatically measured by the layout manager. Unless we explicitly tell it that, hey, we have a dependency on this element. So we, we the simple managed layout, also need to know when this part of the simple managed layout changes. Of course, we need to unregister that also. But then we get events basically from the root element and from the button element, and we know when they change. So what's the difference? Well, element resize listeners, they tell you this element has changed. Manage layouts, they are told by the layout manager, now you need to do layout and you don't really know there what has changed. You just need to know that, you just know that you have to check that everything is as it should. Uh, another option for this, of course, is does the button width only change during compile time? Or is it something that you just want to specify somewhere and have the possibility to change without going through and changing all paddings and possibly margins and something else that need to match for this to work. Well, you can make it a SAS variable. Then you can change the one variable. It will update the CSS where it's needed. And then you have the compile time opportunity to affect this. Of course, it doesn't help if, if the user, if somebody can affect runtime the size of this button. So, uh, ba basically, the core problem hasn't been solved. This is one way of dealing with the fact that we don't get resize events. And uh, as we have seen, it well, it has some limitations. Uh, we don't measure all the elements, provide everything. The layout manager optimizes the layout phase by assuming that the elements, element resize listeners listen to, they don't change while doing layout of connectors and so on. So it's really, this is not the final solution to this issue. It's the way it's in Vardin 7 and I'm sure it could be improved in many ways. Uh, for instance, well, this pretty eager guy here that says he provides resize events. We could use on resize events in Internet Explorer. Uh, if you use Internet Explorer, then we don't need to measure everything. We get resize events. And that's not something we do today. It could be done. Uh, the drawback for the developers, of course, would be uh, we need to support IE differently. But it might very well speed up layouting in IE, even significantly, but I don't know. It's one thing that we might need to look into in the future. Quick question. Yes. So initially when these changes were introduced in Vardin 7, uh, I 
least the first version was quite much slower than the version C one and six. So let's say that in six everything was measured and counted as pixels, but in seven we try to rely more on the uh, CSS and HTML, but still many times the version seven was you know you can be slower than version six. Why? Yeah, uh, <clears throat> that depends on what you mean is slower. Uh, if you talk about the framework as a whole, there are like this many new features which increase complexity on the client side, uh, especially the state handling and how that's implemented at the moment. So I, I would say uh, the layout part is faster in 1 in 7, but there are unfortunately other parts, parts in 1 in 7 which are slower than 1 in 6. And yes, of course, this is also more complex than what in 6 in the sense that it tries to make things work like changing style names somewhere else and stuff like this. Uh, was there some specific change in some minor part in the version like from 7.0 to 7.01 or something that was a significant decrease in performance in the early versions? Yeah, yeah, okay. So but in 7.00, the performance sucked. Uh, but it wasn't directly related to this, it was more related to handling of hash maps in the client and similar things. So uh, if I remember correctly, 7.01 was significantly faster already. Yes, and there are still well, there are still significant improvements that could be made in, in many different parts. I'm sure in this layout manager there are things that could be optimized. Uh, there's also this thing called overflow and underflow events, which actually the browsers do provide. Except IE. <laughs> Except IE, but that doesn't matter because it provides resize. So our flow underflow events, basically scroll bars will appear or disappear now. Uh, there's at least this one guy who has implemented a way to use these overflow and underflow events to get resize events. But the drawback with this approach again is that you need to add three DOM elements per element you want to have events for. So if you have a lot of elements, you will add even more elements. Plus, uh, if you start adding elements inside the widget DOM, you might very well break the widget because it assumes it owns the DOM. And suddenly there are three more elements there. But this is one way that could potentially somehow be used to speed up layouting also. Okay, but I think I'm pretty much done here. <coughs> Now's the time for questions and comments and everything else.